Hi, my name is Harry Jacobs. I am the North of 60 Gamer, and welcome. Before we get into the uh, play of Phantom Epoch, everything you're going to see here is a prototype when we are playing. I want you to keep in mind that this was given to me to preview. I am not a paid content creator. So therefore, if you hear an opinion, it's mine, because I don't get paid. So I can give you my opinion. So, but just keep that in mind that, you know, this was given to me by a publisher, uh, William Bell and uh, uh, Tyson Abernathy, who is the designer. So, you know, you've got to treat it with respect. But there's no worries here. I liked it. I'm just going to give away the farm right off the bat. And I liked it. So, without any further ado, let's get into the credits and let's roll it. So here we are, we're getting ready to set up the tutorial campaign and you can see here are the campaign start instructions and basically what it says is to put A and B together as we've done. You can see I've laid it out horizontal as opposed to vertically. Uh, one of the major issues that we saw of course is that <laughs> the pages are upside down to each other. So um, we're going to have to work with that because I have no way of fixing that spiral brown way of doing it but that is okay uh, I'm gonna walk you through this but so the first thing we are going to do is we're gonna flip our pages and this is where the problem begins of course is that we are looking at this and so we are you can see our map over here and we can see our tutorial mission the awakening and you can see that it's upside down and going to be very hard to read so what we're going to do is we're going to emphasize what's over here but we're going to go through this a little bit at a time so just bear with me as we do that so i have pulled out everything i need even my cell phone i guess so i didn't pull the dice out but i don't need them i don't think yet uh so we're running the introduction the objective is called a uh, break free and so it, my, this is my first mission. This is the tutorial mission. And the first thing it says is to go to page 9 in the rule book, which is over here. We've arranged the mission book. We're going to read the mission introduction. We're going to place the token. And you can see the token is sitting right there because it's going to go there. Um, and then place tokens, campaign treasures, mission treasures, things like that. Uh, gather the adversary description cards, but we don't need to go that far yet because the rules doesn't say that. It just says page nine. So we've done that. And then it says to uh, read the component details on page 31. So let's go to page 31 real quick here. It talks about the campaign sheet, which, which I don't have out right now. That is fine. We have the phantom... Uh, Epoch upgrade board, which I'm not really going to worry about right now, but these are the components and mission components. So mission books, maps. So we have basically done everything we need to do here very quickly. So we're going to get our mission start. So I'm going to take a minute and sort of organize everything. Uh, we're going to go with the, um, whoops, we're going to go with that. We don't need the mutant uh, bad guy here. We're going to go with the, uh, The warrior and the healer and the rogue and then I'm going to show you how these cards set up in a minute you can see the one thing I did change just just for me is that I've laminated three of these so we're going to play a three-handed game not the perfect lamination here uh, but I'll be able to use my um, erase markers and put that in the uh, into the box for the next guy so that way you know these sheets don't get used up and and i can keep track i may play more than one mission here this is also available on tts tabletop simulator if you if you don't know so you can go on to tabletop simulator if you don't have it and you can download the beta version they're, they're upgrading it all the time 
I should say they are updating it all the time. So keep an eye out for there. Uh, I have decided for decided that I'm going to use the little standees there, right there. I think because if I did this, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So like if I did multiple uh, minis. So we are going to use the standees. And so we're going to go from there. So just give me a minute or two uh, to get that uh, rolling. Uh, one thing I want to show you, though, is that I've organized most of the tokens in this Plano box here. And all the um, adversaries are in little baggies such like this, all separated out by species or, or adversarial type. So that's what we've done so far. So um, give me a moment, and we're going to set this all up. So you can see I've set us, set us up at this point. Uh, I've got our standees. We've taken out the three player boards. Uh, so we have a warrior uh, who is a human. We have a Greylock who is our archer. And a slink who is our healer. Uh, this is guard. It has guard plus one against ranged attacks. The Greylock is one converting an action card into an attack action. Add plus one to the effect, and the human says when converting an action card into a move action, add plus one point. Each one gets a starter item, and this critical ability says inflict stun. And you can tell these are starters because they have an X. That's something that wasn't really well laid out in the uh, in the rules. So hopefully they'll correct that. We have corporal hours, so critical ability inflict vulnerability, and here we have critical ability inflict bleed. Now we each start out with ten action cards. There are fourteen action cards that come with the prototype. My understanding is is that there's going to be more cards that you will be able to buy throughout the campaign. So. These are the 10 basic starter decks for each player. And you can see this is the cleric. So we have Soothing Balm, and this is 3 AP. And then you can see he has AP 11, AP 9, AP 10. So you can pick out action cards to the amount of your AP. So you could do a, a, a few actions every turn. And so that is what we're going to do. He also starts out with a medical kit. This is a special thing that uh, the healer can do. At this point in time, we've woken up in our room. We've got absolutely nothing with us because, you know, other than a, a few weapons. So we have our radiant sword, our arethral bow, and our chirurgeon's knife. And range one, range one, range five. So, of course, we want a range. Now, I don't know how important a range is going to be. As we come into here, you can see, you can barely see them, but they're a hexagonal here in the lights. And so there's the hex right there. There's a hex. And then there is a orb of some sort right there. So he, we have basically now set up the game. You awake with a start, cold sweat dripping down your face as you take in your surroundings. This dream felt too real, but... You find yourself on a cold, hard floor of an unfamiliar, unfurnished room with no recollection of how you got there. Three of the walls are a dark grey metal without any blemish on them. Where the fourth wall should be is instead an opening into space. Just as it was in the dream, except now a red planet with swirling gas clouds fills the view. You reach out and feel a solid barrier. It is time to begin. The same voice from the dream, now behind you. You whirl around, but there is no one there. Two portions of the wall melt away, the first revealing a large door, the second a weapon resting in an alcove. You tentatively reach for the weapon and recognize it from the histories of your people. You hold in your hands one of the legendary weapons of the vanished. Break free. The voice commands, the door looks sturdy, but it is not the first door you've had to break down. You ready yourself, repeating the voice's words in your mind. It is time to begin. Greetings, and we are back and ready to play. Here we are. This is the setup. Once you open the door, the only thing I really have to put on is an orb. 
we and we are ready to go we have set up we are using dice to track our hit points so 15 17 and 8 13 and we have our cards here so we have each cards there are 10 cards there are actually 14 cards that came with the game with the game for each but we have to buy them in between so we can make them a little more powerful they each come with their special starting uh, attachment and we have a critical chance so basically our objective is to break free your first mission begins now follow the instructions in the rule book for setup which we did and then we are going to mission start we're going to read the blue thank you very much we're going to just keep going we may deal with that later and for this mission at this point all we're going to do is knock the doors down there's no such thing as critical strikes and fumbles. If we roll a critical strike or fumble, we just roll again. So basically, we're not going to miss. Um, so, But the idea is that you would roll a basic attack, which is this blue dice here. No, nope. um, hang on, where are the dice? Yes, it is your blue dice. Now, normally, we'd also roll the decision dice at the top of the turn, which is a, in this case, would be a east and north. But we have no decisions to make at this point, so we'll just set that to the side. After that, we will go in uh, turn order. Uh, we will each select two cards, and we'll talk about the initiative in a moment. The door is locked. You will have to break it down. So here we're going to talk about destructible objects, because we're going to talk about the doors here. Now, a destructible object has three states, basically. Basically, it's intact, it's damaged, or destroyed. And so, when we attack our doors, we know we have to attack the doors twice. Now, we really can't lose. So, let's start with the lowest, talk about initiative. So, when we talk about initiative, we take our two cards, and we have a six initiative. So, these are the AP. Now, the AP on our cards must be less than the AP on our species cards, in which case it's ten in this case, we have an attack, which is three, which is eight. So you can see five plus three is eight. And finally, we have our two attack, which is four and nine. So basically, our human is going to go first. So when we destroy it, all we have to do is do damage to it. For the, so we have these markers here. These are the damage markers. So normally what would happen is... We may want to do other things, but right now we're only interested in getting out of here. So so what he would do is take his card and he would attack and then use his guard and attack. Now guard gives him a plus one to his, um, the way guard works is, is that you would be attacked and then you would subtract the guard. So it's almost like armor, if you want to consider it for armor. And you can see the uh, mark here. You can see that's just this turn. That's all that means. Is it's just this turn. So we're going to turn the cards off. There we are. We're going to just keep our cards right there. Now, normally you would discard them over here, but you can see we're, we're a little bit tight for space. So uh, the next one would be our, um, that's nine, and this is eight. So our ranged Grelic is going to go uh, blunt shot and penetration, basically the same two things. So as we take our two hits, we're going to put a destruction token on them. And the third action, of course, he's going to do. Now, normally we would roll this dice. Or we would roll. Oh, we actually actually have to roll the dice. But the, the rules basically state that if we do a fumble. Okay, that's the influence dice. If we rolled a fumble, where's the blue dice? There it is. If, there's our action dice. Two, four, three, and a critical strike. So we would roll the dice normally because we're attacking the door. But because the mission event right here tells us that we can't fumble basically and we just re-roll the dice which basically says we wouldn't be using this dice to begin with and the only time we would actually use this dice I think when, is really when we want to attack a person but there could be a point where there's something in the way and we're going to do the same thing here right, we're going to take our cards put them in our pile and same with this guy we're going to take our card and, you know, here's our pile of cards here. 
Okay, so that is the end of the turn. We've broken it. Now, in the rules, it says it suggests we rest. The rest just basically says uh, we're going to get back our cards and we might heal. But in this case, uh, we're not really worrying about healing because we didn't take any damage. So that is it. That is the end of the round. Now, during the round, the initiative, we, if we had someone on the board, and we will eventually have a uh, slink on the board, I believe. Nope, yep, a slink on the board. Uh, we will have to deal with that. But right now, these become a difficult terrain. We've knocked the door down, there's splinters everywhere, and therefore we have to get past. So it's gonna cost us two movement points. And so, let us uh, go on to the next round. The door is reduced to a pile of rubble, freeing you from the confines of the small room. Beyond it is a larger room with the same metal walls, floor, and ceiling as the one you were locked in. To the sides you see more doors. In the middle of the room, surrounded by glowing screens, wires and consoles, a large orb glows with a soft blue light. Place your hand on the orb and it will reveal your path. The voice commands. So the next major thing we need to do is we have to turn on our orb. An orb is just something that basically triggers something within the game and it's off and then it's on. And you can see there's a, it's just on the floor and it's not a destructible thing because it would have a blue frame around it that would show us a destructible. We have some walls here and around here, we can see we have some walls here as well very clearly these are just some lights on the floor and we're ready to go so we're going to just go through the same thing now the, the second bit of the mission is to turn the orb on so with that in mind uh let's um take our cards here and remember these are twos so it's going to take us more than two to get there in fact one two if he wants to get in here one, two, one, two, three, four, five. You might need a five. So, so we can look at the different cards and we can use that. We can always convert because it says over here, we can actually convert into a movement. So if we found a nice little four here, there's the move two, leap four. I don't think we're gonna need a leap four, attack three. There's an attack range two and a parry that's a seven. So being the highest hit points, actually the highest hit points is our ranger. I'm wondering if we want our ranger to um, turn the orb on, but it doesn't. Yeah, so let's do that. So we're going to just move him and we're going to keep him here. Let's strategize because something is going to happen when we hit that orb. And I don't know what is going to happen because we haven't read that far. So, or at least we we'll pretend we haven't read that far. So let's take it cautious. So he's just going to find a move. Guard, guard. Move two, leap four, attack. So he, I think he's just going to use his one attack card. Well, that, that's an AP four. So I don't know whether he wants to do something a little bit better. Okay, must move, move two. We have a move two. That's only going to take us to here. Uh, leap four, attack three. Okay, I, I think... I think we'll do the, uh, we'll convert that into a movement, which will give us four. So he'll, so this is what we'll do. There, he's going to vault at this point. So he's going to vault. Now, normally you would not, because I'm playing solar, of course, I'm always going to know what they do. But normally you would say, I'm going to move closer to the orb. That would be a generality. So we do want to get him to here, which is one, two, three, four. So let's just see what we have for a move. Uh... Gain invisibility, take cover, there's a move five, must end in the space adjacent to a war or an object. Well, there's certainly an object here, but you must move all. So we could go one, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so he's gonna reposition, and you can see he's a, a two right there. And our healer. Let's just see here. What do we got here? Heal. He's not going to heal self at the moment. Heal three. We don't want to lose our heals right away. Uh, plus one against range. So really not uh, attack, attack. Where does he want to go? One, two, 
three, four. So right over there, maybe. So we're looking for a four. Let's convert. Yeah, let's convert one of his attack cards right there for a four. So in this move, so let's take a look. We have a three, a two, and a four. He's going to move first. He's going to move five. Must end on a wall or an object. So anywhere around here would be good. So he's going to go one, two, three, four, and five. So we have moved our ranger, who is named the Dar, after a character in there. Now, as soon as he moves next to the orb, the orb is going to turn on. Oh, no, the orb is on. What is going to happen? <laughs> The orb feels warm to the touch, as you rest your hand on it, a tingling sensation expands from your palm through the rest of your body. The feeling intensifies to the point of being unpleasant, but you find yourself unable to pull your hand away. Suddenly your vision goes dark and the tingling ceases, replaced by a distinct lack of sensation. They are coming, and there is not we can do to stop them. Says a male voice, different from the one before, through in the same language. The voice sounds ancient, wise. Unlike the hollow, emotionless voice you heard previously, this voice feels alive. Perhaps, perhaps not. A female voice responds. What you propose is too dangerous. We will create a failsafe. Even if we fall, those who come after us may yet succeed. A pause, then the male voice answers again with a sigh. Let it be done. With a grasp, you are returned to the cold metal room, your hand still resting on the orb. It is no longer warm, and the inner light has dimmed. Beyond the orb a shimmering blue apparition materializes. It is a lanky figure standing on two legs, its body covered in fur. A slink. It looks you in the eye and knocks an arrow to a wooden bow held in its clawed hand. Oh, the slink is behind the door! So the first thing we're going to do is grab our slink and we're going to just put him on this board right here. And this is his first move. It's a retreat. And we're a light blue, so he's actually four. So he has a seven, a seven, a seven AP. Everybody else here is lower than him at this point. So we're going to go come across to our next AP. Uh, which is a three, so he's going to go one, two, and th one, two, and three, and we're going to come over here as a four, one, two, three, and four, and that is the end of our turn. Now we're going to come up to our slink. Now the slink has specific rules about who he can attack. So the first thing we do in his turn is that we take care of any conditions. Well, since there's no conditions at this point, we don't have to worry about it. So what he's going to do at this point is he's going to fire an arrow at him. Now there is a line of sight, so we can't go from top corner to top corner here. So we may have to move. So we can go from this corner to this corner. Now there's nothing, as far as I can tell, this does not block. This is just an orb on the floor that we activated when we when we got close to it. It brightened up and said, oh shit, there's a guy in that room. Oops. Sorry folks, it is an adult show. So we could take it and, and if we look at, um, so from this corner, which is our bottom right, that would be this corner to this corner, but he can go from here to here which is not blocked. So he is not blocked. What he's going to do, he's going to roll the dice. He's going to roll two, plus his base attack is five. We are not guarding. So basically, we are going to take five damage, just like that. Bang. Oh, that's not the right guy. This is our right guy here. He's going to take five damage. So that is all there is to that move at the moment. So now we're going to come back to the next round. Now these cards now are discarded. They don't exist in our hand unless we rest. And I don't see why we need to rest at this point. So we are just going to take them off the board for the time being. 
and put them off to the side so we don't mix them up. Now, what are we going to do? So let's decide. So if we're ready to go, what we're going to do is start, um, if I was going to pick a card, I would use, um, let's go with Snipe. Where is Snipe? Oh, there it is. So this is attack range plus three. As you know, we are in range with him, but we could also, uh, his range is five. We could take a step back, but there's no probably re reason to. He has a range of six. So even if I go step back, that's not going to happen. So we're going to snipe, but we're going to use leave that as a four. Now he only has seven hit points. Our healer, I think, will uh, let's just do what he does best. We're going to heal five, just to show you the mechanic. Okay, and our he's going to close. So he has a full um, ten AP. So let's see what we can do here. He has a nine. So what, what I'm trying to do right now is uh, I could use a six. Let's just say that we have it and use that as a move. So we can convert his move. So we can actually get seven. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So he only needs a, a, a five or so. So, and this will introduce another concept actually, um, which is good. So what we're going to do is uh, we only need he gets plus one if he converts. So he doesn't need seven, but he needs one. So he needs one, two, three, four, and five. Let's just say he's going to move close. Five. Okay. So he's going to need a five. So we probably need a four. Oh, here we go. Uh, there's a four. We're going to convert this four to a five for a run, and then we're going to do some sort of a attack. So we need we need a five that's an attack. Actually, he might just go right there because he does have a range. So you can see I have a ranged attack right there. So what I'm going to do is actually not do that. I'm actually only going to move two or three. One, two, three. So we're going to look for three. Okay. So we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to say ah. So we're going to do a guard. We're going to, hmm, we might actually use that for a guard. Let's just see what we can do here. There's a three. No, I like this. So let's, uh, uh, no, we can't use that because that's six AP. So that's four. One, two, three. Can we, oh, we have to have a three move, which will take us more than that. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, look at our cards. The next thing we do is we actually pull another slim card which is Rapid Response, Gain Vengeful. Whatever that means. And then we'll take an Archer card. He's light blue, so he has a six. So we have two fours here. First thing I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to heal five. So one, one of the things with healing, you only get a little bit during the, your turn. So with this heal five, he's going to put his token right there. You can only be healed twice during a scenario. After that, you can't be healed. So he is bandaged at the moment. That is his turn. We're going to snipe. We are attack range three. One, two, three, plus three. Um, so we're just going to, it's just a basic, okay, do not roll accuracy checks. This automatically reaches the intended target. Two. So he is going to hit for two. So our Slink, who had seven hit points, and we healed this guy, our Slink now has five hit points. Now, he has seven. We know that the Slink has six. The Slink is Gain Vengeful, which I have no idea what that means. I think we ignore text that we don't understand, but let's take a look what vengeful is. So in gaining vengeful, which is not a detrimental, now normally I would put a beneficial token on here, but because we're only dealing with a limited amount, we won't do that. But there are a bunch of tokens here in my little Plano box right here, and he is vengeful for the turn. But, we, but since we're only dealing with one monster, he is vengeful. What that means, if we're gonna melee him, that uh, we are uh, going to be 
He's going to stand up again. He's not going to get knocked down. He's not going to get stunned. And basically, he's going to take a pot shot of attack minus one on us. But at this point in time, we don't have to worry about that. He is going to take his closest pot shot to our ranger again. Uh, Ladara, that is Yankin, and that is Angeal. So he does a critical strike. Oh, so nope, he hits a, with a four. So four plus his basic attack is seven. Ouch! So he takes off seven and four, leaving this guy with ten. That is okay. Now we are going to convert our... We are going to move three. We, can't, we may... When converting an action card into balance, add one movement point. So we could go one, two, three. Oh, when converting an action card, add one. Okay, so that would put him four. So mm, that's okay. So so if he does that, he's going to go one, one. So he's, he's here. One, two, three, which is red, red, but he has to have one. So he's going to end up right here, four, next to him. So we are now going to convert this into a melee, which is four. We are going to not necessarily blitz it. And so we're just going to do a melee attack, which is a four. So he's going to do four damage to our poor... Poor dude, and then uh, our poor slink, I should say. So he's going to do four damage to the four to the slink, and then what's going to happen after that is that he is now going to do his vengefulness. So he's going to roll the dice. Oh, he looks like he critically struck. So he is going to melee, and that is a uh, three plus a critical hit. Light blue, it says attack range plus two. That's a full draw. But since he's not attacking, it's a melee attack. It is a four attack. And he's going to do four damage to our poor warrior. That is what happens this turn. So we do this all again. So we pick up, take up our cards. We'll just move them off to the side. Now, I don't think we need to uh, worry about uh, this slink particularly at this point. Now, we may need this, this dice. So we're going to roll the dice. And again, this is says it's a south. You can barely read it here. Hopefully, they'll fix that. South and east. Okay. So what happens now is we're going to do the same thing again. Now, what we're really going to do is try to anticipate and try to be lower than the slink. So uh, the, let's take a look at our heavy attack. He only needs a sl so he's going to do that. He's going to play a slash. Uh, he's going to play the attack, and he has a pierce three. So pierce three negates guard. So if you had a guard of four and I had a pierce three, you're down to a guard of one. So it's kind of like armor. And our our guy is not going to do really. He doesn't have to do anything. At this point but he does have to play at least one card um, so he, he could convert oh he's all ranged against one attack so he's not really worried so he'll convert one of these to a movement of some sort just a, a small number so he'll do that so first thing we do we're going to check for AP and then we're going to take our next archery card which is a light which will be three and our slink card, which is a three. He's going to do a move of five. Um, he's got really nowhere to go because he's going to scurry. But he will scurry away over to here. So when he scurries over to here, it's, he's basically now going to be, looks like, yeah, we still have a line of sight. So top right to top right. So top right to top right, we can't do. Top, but we can do to the bottom too. So he's good, but okay. So he has an 8, 6. So we have a 3, a 5, and a 2. 2, he's just going to move. 2, he's going to convert. He's going to go 1, 2. Then we'll just tap that a little bit. We're going to come over here. Here's a 3, attack 1, plus 1. So unless he fumbles, which is a, which would be a total miss, 
No, he does four damage. And would kill our slink. And that would be the end of the turn. The apparition flickers, then disappears from sight as if it never existed. In its place lies a Nova Cell, a small, glowing source of energy that is used to power equipment and as a currency on your home world. Behind where the creature had appeared, a portion of the wall melts away, revealing a brightly lit corridor. The original synthesized voice speaks again. You are not worthy for what comes. You hesitantly step into the corridor, and the voice continues. But perhaps you will be. The wall reseals behind you. Rows of rooms with differing purposes line the corridor ahead of you. Viewports allow you to see out into the infinite space around, and it becomes apparent that you are aboard a starship flying through the cosmos. Welcome to the Phantom Epic. The slink would die. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about was there was an emission effect, and I, I kind of missed that. And the emission effect was in effect that says a new mission event for this round when we attack each character rolls the basic attack die and performs a heal x self where x is equal to the value rolled uh fumbles are created as zero and critical strikes are treated as three um we should have done that we could have healed a couple of these guys but uh, as a result it didn't really matter because we would have um killed this guy anyway i don't know how you would get out of the tutorial without so we have our mission success we get our reward, and we're going to get a skill point, and we've unlocked the first mission in Barkov. We can go back to our ship. We can do things on the ship. We can spend our one point, and we can upgrade a card, perhaps. Uh, we can also, perhaps, buy things. We'll, we'll have to discover that on our own, uh, because I am not going to spoil the mission. What we might do, though, is we might go into the second mission in an extended play to show you the a little bit more of the game, but I'm not going to read anything. We're just going to set it up, and we're going to play it as if it was a standalone scenario, just to give you a little bit more. But that is, not, that is something I'm going to do later this week. But for now, we are done, and let's have some final thoughts. So, Phantom Epoch. Thematically, I always start with the theme. Science, fiction, horror, fantasy. What more do you want? So you've got fantasy characters. You've got a warrior. You've got a ranger. You've got a healer. You're on a planet. You're, you've woken up. You don't know what's going on. The first thing you've done, you're thrown in as you approach and try to escape this first room. Because that's what's going to happen. There's a, probably a door over there as you go in. And now you can say, okay, now i got to go to the second mission, whatever that second mission is. We saw a number of various <coughs> play mechanisms, including the AP, uh, destructible objects, a little bit of combat. We didn't use this dice particularly, but we were never, never had to really. Uh, we saw some uh, combat, uh, we saw some how we got hit points, we saw some healing, uh, things like that, and the way we do our slink cards and our archery cards. So there were a number of concepts, not to mention move as well. And there's lots of things that we can do with our characters. Ranger can go invisible, we can take off, uh, he can heal and he can take off uh, detrimental effects. He can leap. And he can take heavy swings, and he can take all damage. So this is your tank. So there's lots of things that are left to do for you to discover uh, once you play the game yourself. So theme-wise, absolutely wonderful. We're going to move on to the rules. <laughs> so I did have some problems with the rules. I did talk to um, Anthony, the... Um, designer and sort of sent him some notes on my uh, practice playthrough so yeah i did know what was going to happen there so i w was able to anticipate a little bit but uh one of the things i found that the rules were laid out a little strangely uh because you were jumping around all the time like okay go to page two, eight. Oh, and then what is initiative oh i gotta go way over here um so it didn't really follow a, as logical an order as i probably would have liked so if you think of War Mine or even uh, Pandemic 
or even the, some of the Fantasy Flight games like Arkham Horror, they try to take you through at least the first round or two and and then, then throw you at the rules. So one of the things that we could do is have a quick start guide, which they kind of do with the scenario, and it gives you just enough and says, go read this rule and read that rule. That's good. That, that really helped. But there were a couple of concepts like initiative that I really didn't get 100%, and I did have to watch their video. So hopefully, again, all prototype, guys. So this is, may not be the final way these rules look, and there might be some changes. Also, there's going to be some reference cards They asked, I asked about that. You're going to have some reference cards. Like, you bury the icons in the book, and I'm going to have to look it up. We better have it on a sheet much like this, or even in a little book that says, if you've looked at uh, Vito Lasarda book, especially this boa, all the reference stuff is in one book, and you just flip through it and say, oh, yeah, cleric number 53, that's it. So, um, so there are some inherent issues at the moment with the rule book. Hopefully, they will be fixed. Mechanics. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this game. Very easy to pick up, very easy to play. Um, if I would almost say that that first scenario would fit into my five, five, five category, five minutes to set up, five minutes to learn, and five minutes to play. Now, the learn is a little bit flexible. I would say about 10 minutes, so it's not really a true five, five, five game, but it doesn't have the complexity of uh, Jaws of the Lion or uh, Gloomhaven in these types of games. And these games are becoming very, very popular with the spiral bound books, as you know, when you open up to the, the maps and they lead you through the game. So excellent kind of mechanisms that are going on here. The unique mechanism that I really like is, is AP points. You can't use more cards than your AP. So, but you, you don't always want to use all your AP because if you're trying to get under like we did here and go at before the slink to destroy him, we want to have higher initiative so that our attackers can get him first before he picks us off. We don't want to, like in Gloomhaven, there's always that risk. And same here. There's always that risk, right? But if you go with low enough cards, you, chances are you're going to be faster than the slink. Because the bad guys always lose. So, mechanic-wise, I really liked it. Replayability, well, it is a a narrative form game. Uh, I don't know what the final product's going to be, how long this game is, you know, how you got plenty of missions. In fact, there's like 30 missions and branching. Each each planet has like 15 or 14 missions. So there's like at least 60 or 70 missions. There's got to be, just based on that, if it only takes an hour for each mission, and I think some of the missions are going to be bigger, even an hour to two hours, you got somewhere between 50 and 100 hours of game here. Even if it's 150 bucks an hour, 150 dollars, that's three dollars an hour. If you discount the fact that I had to spend three hours, sort of sorting through all this. Um, beyond that, let's. I, I, I. It's hard to speculate value this early on in, in because a I I don't know all what's going to be in the Kickstarter. I don't know what the add-ons are going to be. I don't know what the final character counts and boss counts and monster counts and all those things are going to be. So it's very, very difficult to speculate value. But if you like these type of adventure games, which I do, I don't think 150 is going to be outrageous. Now, Jaws of Lion was cheap. It's 50 bucks retail, right? It was never a Kickstarter. So there, hopefully there will be a standard uh, edition that probably, I, w I would not say, this game probably would probably be a $70, $75 um, retail, perhaps, depending if you don't get everything that the Kickstarter has. So if you get the Kickstarter, you're probably going to get a lot of stuff, and the retail version, maybe not as much. So I don't know how they're planning to place the retail version of this. So, so hard to say where that value is going to fit. Uh, based on my experience here, I think it's a fine game. There's there's lots to explore here. I do want to do another scenario before I have to send this back, or maybe two scenarios. So I am going to have to send this back probably in a week. Uh, so I, I want to get this video out because if I have to do more taping, uh, I want to uh, be able to have that opportunity to get back here and fix things if I've made a lot of mistakes. 
So I want to give it two thumbs up. If you see this on Kickstarter and you like these kind of adventure crawlers with these books and uh, sort of easy, eased in like Jaws of the Lion, then this is going to be a game for you specifically. And I would highly recommend it at this point. This, so one thing I should say, this is not paid. So the opinion you're getting is my opinion. So, um, so keep that in mind when you think about all the things that I've just said, that this opinion is mine. I do not get paid for this. Uh, I do it because I want to bring these games to you and show you these games. And I think the designer uh, should be very proud of this game. And um, he was really looking at sent. And the thing that strikes me the most when I was talking to to Anthony was that it was the AP mechanism is where where he started. Well, I've got this idea for an AP mechanism, and then fleshed it out. So you can see how he's taken something a little bit different to um, give that that mechanism of initiative just something a little bit different, a little, a little different spin. So. Or else what would happen is this would be a same old, same old game. And this is not that at all. This is a unique game. These dice, very, very unique. The this I love the idea. And in fact, this works out way better, I think, than what is in Gloomhaven, where you kind of make a bunch of decisions. Here, I have to make a decision at the end of the day. So, like, if we were looking at our Slink and he was going to fire, let's just say he was going to take his closest target here, what would happen is if this was the primary target, he was his primary target, and say this was here. Now his closest should be this guy. But let's just say we were standing here. They're both two away, one, two, one, two. And he's from here to here, or here to here, where the, if he has to intersect down here, and he's on the orb. But what he would do is he would have to, one of the things he would have to do is this idea of does he hit? So if this is his primary target and he intersects here with the guy next to him, I would actually have to roll this dice. So in this case, he fumbled, which he would miss. But if he had a this, he would actually hit this target or he would miss altogether. So there's always, a, he might miss this guy, which is what we want, or he might, but if he fumbles, sorry. So if he fumbles, he would hit this character as opposed to the target. So he would hit the target here. The target is never part of the thing. So we would move on. If So if there was more than one like, that would be intersecting here, you know, because he's a ranged guy, he would uh, try to uh, try to fight them first. So even if there was, say, an uh, object here, and I was standing here, the object may not be line of sight, so he might have to roll the dice and say, oh, it's great, I missed it. But if he fumbles... He's going to hit the uh, the the, in, in, the destructible object and then wind up putting a marker on it. So there's some unique mechanics here. Uh, so I think it, it sets it apart from that other game. So anyway, that is Final Thoughts. I am going to leave you with that. My name is Harry Jacobs, and thank you for viewing this. I would ask you to hit the thumbs up and say, I like it. Because you know how these things work. If you give me some likes, they put me on the front page. I love that. And uh, if you would, please subscribe. I really appreciate it when you subscribe. Be part of my North of 60 gaming community or the Everything Board Game community or both. Uh, this will go up in two places. Everything Board Games and, of course, mine. So without that, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to start editing. So on your way out, before this goes down, hit the swirly subscribe or actually subscribe, recommended by this really subscribe. So that is it for now. I am out of here, folks. It is time for coffee.